Well, hello and um, welcome everybody uh, to this um, event, to this uh, book launch and webinar. Uh, my name is Martin Roos. I'm Deputy Director of the Migration Policy Center at the European University Institute. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Katharina Nata, who will uh, talk about her new book on the politics of immigration beyond liberal states. It's been very recently published with um, Cambridge University Press and includes uh, a lot of interesting, fascinating analysis that will be, or that is relevant to um, a lot of research that we're also doing here at the Euro European University Institute on migration politics uh, in general, and also with the geographic focus on Africa. So I'm delighted that uh, Katarina has taken the time uh, to visit us here and present her book um, today. Uh, Katharina is assistant professor at the Political Science Institute uh, of Leiden University, and her research examines migration politics from a comparative perspective. I'm also very grateful to our two discussants who have agreed to uh, speak for about 10 minutes each after Katharina has had a chance to make a brief, brief presentation um, of her book. Uh, we have uh, Mehari Tadele Mari, Maru, who is a part-time professor at the Migration Policy Center here at the EUI. And he's also the academic coordinator of the Young African Leaders Program at the School of Transnational Governance at the EUI. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to also welcome uh, Christoph Roos, who is a professor for European and Global Governance at the Europa Universität uh, Flensburg. And um, Christoph has done a lot of uh, research on migration governance in, in general, and he has recently also written on uh, what the EU is doing on migration in, in various African countries. So thank you to the two discussants as well. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Katarina for about 15 minutes or so. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Martin, for yeah, organizing this and for hosting me here at the EUI. And thanks also to Christoph and uh, Mehari for accepting uh, to discuss my book. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to your comments and, and thoughts about it. Um, so I wanted to take this uh, 15 minutes um, to introduce a little bit uh, my motivation for doing this research in the first place, and also, um, yeah, what I hope to contribute with it to broader debates on migration politics. Um, so I started thinking about the dynamics uh, underlying immigration politics back in 2010, when I was a student, um, sort of having an exchange year in Cairo, um, bachelor student, 19 years old, and it was really the first time that I realized the impact immigration politics and policies had on people's individual lives, obviously being very privileged myself with an Austrian passport. Um, that really uh, struck me in Cairo, both um, amongst the Egyptian students around me who wanted to maybe study in Europe or elsewhere, but also um, the Sudanese language students that I had um, uh, there uh, where I was giving uh, language classes and whose refugee status was ignored um, by the Egyptian state back then and actually still uh, nowadays. And so um, when I came back to Paris to uh, write my master's thesis, I decided to focus on the politics around immigration in North Africa and uh, focusing on uh, Morocco uh, back then. And at the time, and that makes me feel a little bit old already, um, I was really um, struck by the fact that there was very little scholarship on the politics outside Western liberal democracies. And um, that really bothered me. It bothered me on the one hand because it sort of assumed that there was nothing else to study out there, although we all know that there's like half of the world's migration happens elsewhere um, on this, around the globe. But it also um, bothered me because there was an assumption built into the literature that the politics around migration in democracies and autocracies would be fundamentally different beasts and could not be sort of studied uh, under one umbrella. Uh, and of course, common sense would uh, tell us, let me see whether this works. <clears throat> yes, um, common sense would tell us that the ultimate test for liberal democracies is to safeguard the rights of the weakest, so minorities and foreigners. And on the other hand, why would we expect that autocracies would safeguard migrants' rights if they are um, restricting citizens' rights on an everyday basis? And so that's sort of the starting point and following this logic also a lot of scholarship around immigration uh, policy has advanced the idea 
of the regime effect. Many of you will be familiar with it just very quickly and in a very simplified way. Um, studies um, around the politics of immigration have suggested that there is an inbuilt tendency to liberalize immigration in a democratic context because of specific institutional dynamics, such as economic lobbies or courts. And the reverse assumption, which is less has been less explicit, but still there in the literature, is um, that, well, autocratic leaders are assumed to be all powerful uh, and independent in their decision making, and so uh, therefore would tend to enact restrictive immigration policy. Now, the problem with this regime effect, the way it stood at the time, was that it was mainly based on studies looking at liberal democracies. And so I thought, OK, how can we know what is the specific effect of liberal democracies if we're only looking at liberal democracies and not at the counterpart? Now, in the meantime, of course, that was 10 years ago. In the meantime, there has been uh, quite a lot of research on migration politics in uh, more authoritarian settings. And that has really helped to sort of fill um, this empirical gap, empirical knowledge on um, drivers of migration policy in autocracies. However, apart from a few um, great exceptions, of course, um, mainstream theories on the politics of immigration still remain quite regime specific. So there is not a lot of dialogue between sort of uh, theories on how are immigration politics made in liberal democracies and how are migration politics made in autocracies. And so what I tried to do with my PhD research and then uh, also with, with this book, which is sort of a reworked version of it, is to answer this, this question, um, how do political regimes shape immigration policy making by comparing two cases that have undergone uh, different political regime dynamics. And so what I did uh, to just quickly situate the two cases, I compared Morocco and Tunisia. Um, many of you will uh, know that Morocco is obviously a monarchy that has undergone a process of autocratic consolidation over the past decade, um, while Tunisia um, has started a process of democratic transition back in 2011. And that seems to have found um, some uh, sort of end already uh, in 2021, continuing the last uh, one and a half years. And I'll get back to that um, in a bit. And so based on, on the literature, the theoretical expectation would be that we would see migration restrictions in Morocco and migration liberalization in democratizing Tunisia. But that's not what we saw on the ground. And that's what sort of uh, invited me to, to also contrast and compare these two cases. So what we saw in Morocco is that uh, migration has become an important political issue uh, over the 2000s. And migration politics were very restrictive in, in the 2000s. And, um, uh, lots of violence against migrants that we also, I guess, hear in the press. But in 2013, uh, the king launched a so-called liberal policy reform, which entailed the regularization or two regularization campaigns, um, as well as a series of so-called integration measures. Um, uh, yeah, but the labor market, healthcare systems, etc. Can go into details later if if you would like. Um, and this um, liberal policy reform has gathered a lot of attention, both domestically and, uh, and internationally. And obviously, over the last years, um, there has been also some setbacks. So some of the announced uh, changes have not been implemented. Um, violence has been sort of reinstalled at the northern uh, borders. So um, there has been some, some mitigated results of this announced liberal reform. But nonetheless, I think what's really important to say is that um, this reform has really created a strong positive political discourse around immigration in Morocco that really um, continues until uh, today. In Tunisia, what we see is that democratization has not led to liberalization, but actually to the continuity of the restrictive immigration policy inherited by the authoritarian regime of Ben Ali. And it's also quite interesting um, uh, to mention that actually, um, if we look at numbers of migrants on the ground, uh, in Morocco, immigration remains relatively small scale, while in Tunisia, immigration has really increased quite substantially since 2011, with the arrival of both sub-Saharan African migrants, but mainly Libyan citizens. And the political discourse um, has focused mainly on sub-Saharan African migrants and ignored the presence of, of Libyans, despite the fact that they make up 80% of um, uh, migrants within within Tunisia and that's something quite quite interesting to note and so just quickly what happened in Tunisia after 2011 there was this uh, drive 
also within society, civil society to ask for more migrants' rights, sort of in co to be coherent with the uh, revolutionary ideals and human rights. But um, there has actually been a sort of consensus within uh, the political sphere at the time to not politicize migration, to not go into the topic of migration at all. And the result of this was the absence of policy change and the continuity of the restrictive policies in place. Now, some of you might have heard about the infamous speech of President Kais Said on the 21st of February, where um, he basically um, claims that sub-Saharan immigration uh, is part of a great replacement strategy by the European Union to annihilate the Arab character of Tunisia. Um, and we can talk more about that afterwards. Um, but what is important uh, to say here is that this really broke this um, sort of cohere or this sort of agreement to not politicize immigration in, in Tunisia. Now, what I do in the book, obviously, I'm, I'm not treating these latest developments because the book came out before, but what I do is I relate developments in immigration politics to broader political regime dynamics. Um, and so the empirical part, just quickly for those of you who, who don't know, the empirical part is focused on the period between 2000 and 2020. But in some of the chapters, I really try to take a more um, historical lens and to understand also the some of the continuities um, and roots of the current trends. Um, and also hope uh, that maybe some, some of the analysis in the book helps to make sense of what's going on right now. Now, um, let me just, um, in the remaining time I have, say quickly what the two sort of main arguments are that I make in the book, apart from the empirical contribution that I hope to make. Um, first of all is, um, of course, this, this claim um, that I make that we need to sort of uh, go beyond the, the regime effect as sort of a, a dominant analytical lens. Because what I realized when, when doing the study and comparing and contrasting Morocco and Tunisia was um, that in sort of I found a more useful framework for analysis, not this regime effect framework, but actually to take immigration policy as a vantage point, as a lens, analytical lens to understand broader political change and state transformation. Now, what do I mean by that? Very quickly, in Morocco, uh, what the research um, showed is that the liberal immigration reform um, actually was not contradictory to uh, authoritarian consolidation, but was part and parcel of this pro uh, process because it has allowed the king to portray himself as a sort of liberal monarch and hereby to increase his legitimation both at home in front of progressive um, parts of Moroccan society, as well as abroad, both in front of European, but importantly also African uh, diplomatic partners. And so in the words of a respondent, the palace understood that it was a good card to play for Morocco. In the, Tunisia, on the other hand, um, as I mentioned, uh, the sort of increased political rights for um, Tunisian citizens after 2011 didn't go hand in hand with more migrants rights for um, or more rights for migrants. Um, instead, we have this consolidation of restrictive immigration policy because actors across the political spectrum agreed that it was best to focus on improving the Tunisian situation, which was challenging economically, politically, and to not sort of venture into the politically dangerous area of migration politics. And so for almost a decade, there was this deliberate non-politicization of immigration. Again, one of my respondents said very uh, clearly, I think that the non-management of migrants in Tunisia reflects a choice. Now, again, this consensus around non-politicization seems to have been broken by uh, say its speech recently, and um, we will see where this uh, will lead in the midterm. The second uh, claim that I'm hoping to make with the book is more theoretical and will um, hopefully uh, provide some food for thought, both for comparative immigration research, but also broader public policy uh, research um, um, out there. Um, so what I'm, uh, oops, that's not supposed to come like that, but anyways. Um, so what I'm uh, trying to do with my research and based on this empirical knowledge on Morocco and Tunisia, is to fine tune uh, the role of political regimes in immigration policy. So instead of sort of saying, yes, there is a regime effect and no, there is none, try and find out the scope conditions of when the political regime matters out there. And so I tried to do that by specifying which policy processes are actually affected by the political regime in place and which policy processes are occurring regardless of political regime dynamics. Now, uh, in the book, then, I have uh, these three different types of policy processes. 
The first I call generic policy process, um, because these are dynamics that emerge out of the very essence of policymaking in modern states. So this could, for instance, be um, the fact that there will always be gaps between what politicians say, what is enacted in law, and then what happens on the ground, just because of the way in which um, bureaucracies and, and states are structured um, worldwide. And so these dynamics then happen across political regimes, but also across um, different policy areas. So this has nothing to do with immigration as such. Um, the second uh, type I, I call issue-specific policy processes, which um, are inherently linked to the questions that immigration raises for state sovereignty and for the ways in which interests on immigration are structured. So issue-specific, in my case, immigration-specific, but you could do the same exercise about health or uh, social policy if, if you would like. And so in the case of immigration, for example, this could be bureaucratic dynamics. Across the globe, if you're looking at how ministries of interior deal with immigration, they're very likely to take on a security lens while dealing with irregular migrants, while ministries of health might be more sympathetic to open up um, healthcare to undocumented uh, migrants because their primary goal is to secure public health. So these sort of institutional um, dynamics shape the ministerial positions on immigration um, across political regimes. And I think that has um, been rather ignored in the, in the literature so far to look at the similarities across political regimes. But then of course, the last um, type of, of policy dynamics out there would then be regime specific, which are those where uh, the regime effect would kick in and which are indeed very different depending on the political circumstances within which um, these policies unfold. And the most obvious example would be probably the role of legal actors, right? Um, sort of the leverage to guarantee migrants' rights um, is fundamentally different across political regimes, um, just because the rule of law plays a different role uh, within an autocratic or a democratic political system. But what I think um, sort of this um, typology maybe helps to do is to delineate more precisely the boundaries of the regime effect. Now, of course, this is only sort of a starting point to, to think about, uh, about these things. And there has been a lot of exciting research that came out the last years that I'm also discussing in the book, which um, kind of validates or, or, or supports some of my hypotheses also with research from other areas around the world. Um, but what I, what I think is sort of the main uh, claim there that I would like to, um, to push for is that I think the theoretical toolbox out there for analyzing immigration politics is not as fundamentally different across political regimes as uh, has often been assumed. So overall, analyzing the politics around immigration is about finding out who are the clients, clients or uh, however you want to call it, um, the, the, the audiences of a specific immigration policy. Um, so that can be so specific socioeconomic interest groups, specific parts of a bureaucracy, ethnic, specific ethnic groups or diplomatic partners, and how these clients then in turn contribute to the regime's domestic and international legitimacy. And so working with that can help us sort of make sense of immigration politics across um, political regimes. Now, very quickly, just uh, the last afterthought or, or sort of um, why I think it is important to revisit our assumptions on the role of political regimes. It's enough to look a bit around in, in the world, right? We can think about Aragon's open door uh, refugee policy until 2018, but also about the rights denying reforms of the social Democrats in, in Denmark that really don't fit with some of the assumptions of um, the literature as, the, as it was out there. And so to explain these, um, uh, um, sort of practices and realities out there, I think it's really important to question um, the still often very binary worldviews um, within the literature um, that split the world into democratic or autocratic or liberal, illiberal, weak and strong states, global north, global south, whatever. There are loads of these binaries out there. And to really try and identify um, the similarities uh, across these categories, but also the differences within them. Now I'll leave it at that. I'm really curious to hear uh, what um, Hari and Christoph um, did with the book, how, how they found it, and also to take some questions afterwards. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katarina. It's of course impossible to present the book in 20 minutes, but I think you've done a great job in giving us the main ideas and main messages. So we'll now continue with the two discussants and we will start with uh, Mehari. So over to you. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Martin. And uh, also thank you, my colleagues from MPC. Uh, and also congratulations uh, to Katharina uh, for this eye-opening, I must say, uh, also intellectually, both comforting and discomforting at the same time. Uh, this book, uh, I find it very, very helpful uh, and intellectually stimulating, if you wish. Um, and it reassures some of the assumptions that I had uh, when it comes, some of the thoughts comes as uh, uh, firm conclusions of your book. Um, and I think, uh, in a way, uh, the uh, the book successfully shows the uh, the multiple inter interplay of multiple factors, uh, state interest at national level, uh, into uh, to an extent even local, uh, the issue of identity, bureaucracy in general, and uh, international relations, uh, particularly given the geopolitical or ge geography of Morocco and Tunisia and their proximity to Europe, which is an important aspect of this discourse. But I want to take you a little bit uh, back to the point you said. Um, um, in your book, I think uh, there was a very important point that you raised, uh, the fact that uh, you have this paradox, uh, the paradox illiberal or liberal uh, in liberal systems, whatever name you give it, but the paradox that seems paradox is not actually, it's not a paradox. It's because there was an assumption, actually, like you say in your, your article, in your book, you make it uh, plainly clear that the assumption that a democratic dispensation probably, or countries with disp democratic dispensation like Tunisia uh, would lead to more uh, protective, uh, migrant sensitive, migrant protective uh, systems and liberal immigration law. There might be discrepancy within that. What does it mean to be protective of human rights of migrants or migrants' rights in general and liberal, uh, uh, more, uh, less restrictive migration uh, regime? But um, also the second minor point I want to make is um, also the difference between generally autocratic and authoritarianism in general. I think in African context, we have many systems because there are traditional systems, religious systems uh, that are social base uh, for legitimacy, legitimacy of governance, uh, to uh, legitimacy for governments to really exercise what they are exercising. Uh, in some cases, it could come at the geographic legitimacy from uh, or ethnicity or uh, it could be even uh, some other religious uh, basis. And this plays in a big way uh, in, this, uh, in the formulation of uh, policy on migration. So I generally would like to put uh, the issue of uh, the concept of authoritarianism as a broader than autocratic uh, systems, if you wish. And the, second mi the third minor point I want to make before I make the main point that I want uh, to table it there is um, Morocco and Tunisia are uh, peculiarly positioned because of the geography to Europe and the, dis the discussion, the discourse on migration has been unfairly dominated by the small part of migration that is happening in Africa that is uh, on the Mediterranean route, especially with the policy of containment of Europe and the fact that uh, some of the sovereign acts of a state has been externalized, as we know, in these countries through different in institutions. And I think that plays also to an extent uh, that uh, Morocco and Tunisia do not necessarily represent uh, the context and the situation in Africa and how regimes do manage uh, migration because they, are, uh, uh, they have their own peculiarity. Now, uh, the book raises two fundamental questions. One of them, I think you put it uh, in your slides. Uh, the first one being, uh, to what extent do political regimes shape immigration politics? And the second one, what does immigration policy making reveal about the inner working of democratic and autocratic systems? In my opinion, the first one, I thought was more fundamental than the second. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, do political regimes indeed shape or change uh, the immigration politics. And I think that's very important uh, for various reasons. And I want to give one or two pointers in regard to that. 
And I think the conclusions also of your book, the fact that national identity approach uh, rhymes a lot, if you wish, it has a lot of resonance uh, in the uh, African continent uh, in general, uh, because uh, regime type internally uh, and their legitimacy relates to three things. Power politics, because they have to stay in power, I think there is strategic survival instinct for regimes to survive, whether they are autocratic or democratic, if you wish. Uh, power politics plays a big role in this. And identity politics, especially in Africa, especially with migration, is big. And to an extent, resource politics, be it resource that is coming as diplomatic support, finance from the external actors like European Union and so on for Morocco and Tunisia. Or it, it could be even uh, resource politics in terms of control of resource in border areas and how migration relates, for example, to South Africa or so, which is a stark, I mean, completely different uh, situation. But in terms of policy, policy South Africa, uh, even if it's democratic, majoritarian ethnic democracy, if you wish, but it, it has a policy that is very similar to Europe. Uh, while um, a country like uh, Rwanda, who, which has identity politics as internal part of the, re the region's uh, migration policy, because it has gone through uh, a genocide, and there seems to be internally, uh, genocide has framed uh, the, uh, the policy of Rwanda's regime, but it is authoritarian, if you wish. It's authoritarian compared to that, but it's very uh, capable of implementing what it wants to implement on migration. So the identity, uh, national identity approach that you mentioned in, in your book has a lot of resonance in many ways, but also uh, you pointed out that autocracy appears to have greater freedom to choose. Uh, even I say beyond that, uh, the capacity, the capability to implement what they wish. It's not only the will, but beyond the will, the capability of the regime to implement is very important. And in some cases, some countries are unable really to uh, put their border under their purview because they have limited capability and they know this one. And when they do agree with other partners, for example, like Europe and so on, uh, uh, they don't really take that one as a serious. And it goes to the generic type of policy making that you mentioned. But also there is imbued assumption that this is something that they lo look at it as a foreign policy uh, or uh, foreign diplomacy aspect also. So um, in the case of Tunisia, uh, in comparison, I mean, before 2013, uh, before 2011, actually, the uh, uprising, uh, uh, there, is, there is more competitive power politics. Uh, it's not to say that there is no power politics in Morocco, but this is competitive, it's open. And during competitive constituency and identity politics, uh, power politics plays a big role. Uh, and uh, relations with Europe also plays a big role uh, to use it as part of uh, the power 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 play basically in the this competitive election. In Morocco, you don't have that competitive election. So therefore, uh, the role of this kind of uh, agenda are less and the responsiveness of the uh, regime for this is actually uh, less. The, uh, it's, 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 uh, the, it's actually the Moroccan regime is considered uh, as one who has saved the country from uh, the potential turbulent situation that they are in. Let me put one point and then I will end there, uh, Martin. And the second point I want to raise in this relation is the capability and autonomy and agency of the regime themselves. I think it depends, I mean, Gambia, how much uh, capability, autonomy and agency does it have as a regime vis-a-vis -vis Europe? Uh, I think it's a big question. So the capability aspect is also important. Are they really sovereign in the sense that they can make their own policy and implement it effectively? And there, compared to Rwanda, for example, which has more capability to implement 
And if it chooses, indeed, it can implement it and gives them more room for maneuver in terms of what policy. They are not to say they are not prone to uh, constituency politics, to, uh, to pressure from both internal and external. Indeed, they are, even those developmental authoritarian states, but they, are, uh, they have much more room uh, for maneuver than uh, other states. Let me stop here, Martin, and maybe later, if time permits, I will bring some more points in the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Mihari. Uh, I know it's it's reasonably early where you are, so thanks for joining us and thanks for your comments. We'll we'll continue with uh, Christoph and then we'll give uh, Katarina a chance to respond before we open up to, to the audience. Christoph. Uh, so thank you, Martin and MPC, for um, the invitation to discuss this fine book. I shortcut on the praise now because we have um, we are already uh, short on time. So what I what I was going to say about um, um, the the fine uh, the, the the quality of about of your book is that this is a significant contribution. Uh, it provides a theoretical and analytical tools to understand migration politics beyond Western states within different regimes, and it teases out the weight of the regime effect. So this is a really great uh, ambition, and uh, you also mastered uh, delivering on this ambition. Empirically, I also think that this is very well done. You lay out the empirical chapters nicely. You first analyze Im immigration policy, and then you establish this knowledge with the reader, and then you go and then explain how it come it came about. And while you do that, you test all your assumptions and hypotheses that you um, uh, um, derived from your theoretical chapter. So this is really nicely structured and nicely laid out um, and sets an example for other um, um, research that um, explores puzzles and tries to make a theoretical contribution. I also learned a lot from you. Um, so I learned in terms of, um, uh, because you give so much insight and depth to your empirical chapters. So we learn a lot about Morocco beyond the immigration issue, as well as Tunisia. We learn about the region. It's a, it's a, we learn about Pan-Africanism, about the, the, the knowledge hub and the economics of the region, and um, also the, the shift to uh, populism in Tunisia, which I find interesting. And thirdly, on the con conceptual level, I very much appreciated the typology that you provide. So the, the difference between the specific, the issue specific, the generic and the regime effects. And I think this is this could be suitable for other research that asks similar questions. Um, and it also helps you, uh, like this typology helps you to identify uh, the regime effect that you are after and also establish your, um, your, your argument basically of the illiberal paradox um, that you then discuss in a, a later chapter. So in terms of critique, I have three uh, core issues that I want to raise. Um, the first is uh, justification of the Tunisian and Moroccan cases as democratic or authoritarian. And then I would like to challenge you a little bit on the, on the argument of the illiberal paradox. And I think Mehari already did some of that, uh, but I uh, go further on it. Maybe we can, we can pull it a notch further. So, um, the time frame that observes uh, Tunisian policymaking um, during its transition from authoritarian dictatorship towards a liberal democracy um, is important in terms of um, um, I, 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 I question so about democracy. So democracy or the, the quality of democracy measures in terms of political conflict and how different value divides in society can express themselves. And, um, and that expression is done by parties and the competition between parties. And on a descriptive and empirical level, I missed a thicker description of the main cleavages in Tunisia uh, on which a party system could potentially build after 60 years of dictatorship. Uh, and to, to what extent do parties position and structure according to, I don't know, maybe a secular and religious divide or in terms of a cultural cleavage or a state versus market divide in terms of the socioeconomic cleavage. So that's what we usually use as a grid apply in terms of understanding divides on immigration policy. So culturalist versus socioeconomic. And I ask this because I would like to know how immigration policy could possibly be discussed in a transitioning democracy. You know, if we then relate it to the different fields. 
And if party systems do not politicize on certain issues, it hints at low institutionalization of cleavages and limited stability of the party system. So the case of Tunisia hints at, weekly institution, at, at a weakly institutionalized party system, which is typical for transitioning systems. Thus, I would like you to question whether Tunisia actually qualifies as a case of a democratic country. And if we wanted to generalize uh, the regime effects or the non-effects, um, uh, Tunisia needed to be a comparable case for other transitioning countries. Uh, not only Tunisia, I think, would benefit from such a description of cleavages and in their institu institutionalization, but also Morocco. And um, so I th that was just my feeling as a reader, I'm not a country expert, but I thought the, the Moroccan case was put into the authoritarian category quite quickly. So it is a constitutional monarchy that is authoritarian. However, it also has a parliament. Um, so is there no, like does the parliament have, has no say in terms of um, immigration policy making? How, is the debate completely removed from parliament and exclusively within the realms of the king? And I think you could give some more explanation on uh, to what extent the country qualifies as an authoritarian country uh, in terms of the role of the parliament within the political system. And finally, on your main argument, I would li like to challenge you a little bit yeah. also uh, on the notion of the illiberal paradox and push uh, this argument a notch further. So I ask myself, to what extent can the illiberal paradox be a paradox in terms of uh, immigration policy? So the liberal paradox, as coined by Holyfield and, and Freeman, describes a contradiction between uh, liberal norms that pull for openness and democratic rights that pull for closure. And taking the, the liberal paradox seriously as the starting point of the reasoning, I would challenge you and say an illiberal paradox in terms of immigration policy may be more of an intuitive observation. Um, so for the paradox that you observe, we had to assume that illiberal systems in terms of limitations for democratic participation in government and the rule of law produce less liberal immigration policy. However, uh, empirical observations as like on the empirical as well as the theoretical level, I, I would not think so. Um, like just thinking about the Gulf states, like pretty much all authoritarian um, absolute monarchies are the, the, the main destination region for labor migrants in the world. Russia is a main destination region for uh, labor migration from Central Asia. Um, so and therefore, um, I wonder, uh, maybe I missed it, I missed your explanation for the paradox. And intuitively, of, of course, you would think that an authoritarian system is less open. Uh, but empirically, I make a different observation. So the case of Morocco shows that there may be something different than a paradox to be observed, um, at least what I, what I observe in your book or how I read your book. So apparently, it does not need liberal constraints to produce liberal outcomes. In that sense, I think, the, I think we observe um, a case of authoritarian freedom instead of um, an illiberal paradox that shapes immigration policy to the liking of the leader in charge. So authoritarian freedom may take a liberal turn in terms of Morocco um, because the king, as you nicely explain, wants to give his regime a, a, liberal, uh, a liberal outlook, but it may also turn illiberal in terms of the Ben Ali dictatorship um, before the revolution. So it's basically, yeah, the, 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 the authoritarian leader is in charge to do whatever they want. And that's a case of freedom and, and not less of a counterintuitive um, or in terms of empirics and theory finding. So I stop here because this is enough food for thought. And um, in general, and I really enjoyed reading your book from cover to cover. It was a great read. and. Um, like I really enjoyed the theory testing exercise you advanced in the beginning, the theoretical innovation that you bring about, and also your your rigorous empirical research. Like this is superb. Uh, thank you very much. And um, so I will certainly recommend this book to any colleague that I know or to any librarian. Great. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um,
20 minutes. I think we can probably go over a little bit. I would like to do that, but, but we can. So Katarina, I mean, you could just give a very brief response if you would like no more than kind of three minutes, just picking on, on what, and then we can come back at the end as well, because I'd like to open it up as well sure. to the audience here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mihari and uh, Christoph, for, for sharing your, your thoughts. And obviously, I cannot do justice uh, to respond to, to this in, in three minutes, but maybe just to, to pick out um, some, some of the points. Um, I think both of you, well, let me first uh, go on the, on the democratic and, uh, and autocratic boxing of Morocco and Tunisia and whether um, sort of that is a so solid enough starting point uh, in terms of a comparison. Um, I'm, I totally agree with you, obviously, that Tunisia is not a consolidated liberal democracy, but actually what I try to do in the book is to look at, at Tunisia as a context where these processes are in the making. And so my expectation would be that in the process of democratic uh, transition, um, the dynamics that we take for granted in liberal democracies are sort of in the making and easier to be observed. So that is sort of empirically <laughs> What I what what my hope uh, is that um, that sort of the things that are typical for liberal democracy are are most visible at that point. And then of course what I what I do in the book I also contrast and compare my empirical material with the vast empirical literature that's out there on Western liberal democracy. So I felt I don't need to repeat that that research. I can bring more of an added value if I look into a case where these things are unfolding. That was at least my my reasoning uh, behind it. Um, and I'll maybe st stick to that just for the, for the response now. Um, both of you have also um, touched upon this question of the liberal and illiberal paradox. And I totally um, also agree with what Mehari said at the beginning that, well, it is only insofar a paradox as the initial, like the starting assumption was kind of wrong, right? Um, so the, the initial assumption also of the liberal paradox um, is one um, um, that actually we don't we don't see in, in practice. And, and so um, similarly, I think the same problem by sort of adapting this vocabulary of the illiberal paradox, I fall in, I fall into the same trap, but this is sort of uh, purposefully done, let's mm -hmm. say, because I want to speak to this literature that's still um, like mainstream dominant literature out there that's still, repeats over and over again um, that there is something inherently um, specific about liberal democracies. Um, there's something that is um, really linked to the way in which immigration is discussed as a theme and that is incomparable with more autocratic systems. And so I play basically with this initial fallacy in order to also um, sort of then highlight the the specificities, but also the similarities across political regimes. Um, so that's that's why I um, I sort of use this term of illiberal paradox, although I'm actually not convinced myself that it is a real paradox. I don't think it is a real paradox. As you have pointed out, it is actually, well, it would be the intuitive assumption. Why would we have liberal policies in illiberal regimes? Uh, but actually, as you say, empirically and also theoretically, um, also the work of Martin right on, on, on the Gulf and when it comes to labor migration um, shows us that there are many states out there um, where there are uh, liberal or open uh, policies towards immigration being uh, assumed. And I like your notion of authoritarian freedom, though um, I'm a bit wary of, of using it, <laughs> I think, because, because um, well, to what extent really we can talk about freedom in the context, well, authoritarian freedom in the sense of the authoritarian leader has the freedom uh, to choose, but well, it, it has such a positive tone with it. So I'm not sure I like it. And I'm going to stay there because I'm curious to also hear maybe um, others have questions and maybe I can come back to some of them. Yes, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you, um, Katarina. We'll now take a round of questions from the room and I will then turn to our um, online participants. So I see Diego, you already have your hand up. If you just uh, hold that for a second. And if anybody else has a question, if you're online, please put your hand up as well and that I'll come to you in the second, in the second round. So we'll, we'll collect some questions from the room if anybody has any comments or questions. Fabian, go ahead. Thanks for this very interesting and inspiring presentation. It's always good to get new insights and perspective. Um, just well, to provoke a little bit discussion. I mean, I'm quite a simple-minded administrator working in the field of migration, and there my intuitive 
approach to why is a is there a res, repressive migration policy a liberal migration policy i would always say the main parameter for determining a policy reaction is the migratory pressure so a country which has a huge inflow of irregular migration and asylum seekers will sooner or later adopt a repressive migration policy a country which is not exposed to migratory pressure like canada or ireland like iceland for them it's easy to have a sort of a liberal migration policy i don't i know you can contest this but i think it's nevertheless the migratory pressure is a very important parameter and when you're doing comparisons at least you should try to not to compare apples with potatoes but compare situation countries with similar migratory problems or migratory pressure that's what i wanted to say thank you um uh, martin yeah thanks uh, katrina very interesting um so i look forward to reading your book um and uh, it's a great uh, starting point and um so on the toolbox and your argument that this can be generalized uh, across uh, regimes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it makes sense that um, to some extent the tools are the same in the sense of the actors. That's mainly what you refer to, right? So employers, of course, you have in democracies and non-democracies. Um, so when I think about um, uh, uh, the theory that is applicable here, I, I think it's less interesting to think about the assumption that democracies are expected to be more liberal, EI more inclusive. I'm thinking more of, let's say, client politics models, right? And yeah, it does seem to me that uh, even though some of the actors may be comparable, the mechanism should be a bit different, right? So, um, of course, electoral politics, uh, wouldn't uh, be expected to play the same right so this uh, should be especially restrictive pressures in democracies rather than in uh, non-democracies um, maybe the employers are sort of uh, similar but um, labor unions then of course also typically have a strong role in political uh, theorizing about migration dynamics and maybe they are i would expect them to have a, an understated uh, role in uh, non-democracies compared to democracies, right? So can you say something about even if the actors are comparable, uh, are the mechanisms also the same? Thank you. I've got two more people on my list. Uh, Daniel, then Lorenzo, anybody else? Uh, great, thanks. Um, uh, I, I haven't had the chance to read your book yet, but I'm certainly now looking forward to it. Um, so my question, perhaps you discussed it at length in your book, so perhaps... Um, um, uh, it, it, it's it's a bit naive, but what do you mean uh, specifically by um, liberal migration policy? So is liberal just another word for open in the sense that many people can get in? Um, or is liberal, does it mean sort of in the sense of liberal thought, liberal ideologies, um, which would mean something like the protection of rights and so on? And how does that uh, sort of fit with autocratic regimes? Thanks. Thank you. Lorenzo? Yeah, thanks a lot, Katharina. Uh, also looking forward to reading the book. My question, I think, expands a bit on what Martin already asked. So from your presentation, I got the impression that a very important driver for migration politics in these countries is the king in Morocco and, and the government um, in Tunisia. But I was wondering whether some other actors also play their role, namely international organizations uh, that, uh, that you mentioned, groups of interest mentioned by, by Martin, um, and also civil society organizations. One could uh, hypothesize, hypothesize that because of the democratic transition in Tunisia, there were bigger pressures from um, civil society to adopt more liberal uh, policies towards migrant populations. So mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, sorry, the list is getting longer. If you're okay, you just... Um, I'm happy to collect. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I think that might be best given an in interest of time. Uh, Bronwyn? Thanks. This goes somewhat in the same line as um, Fabian's question. I'm Bronwyn Manby. I'm a Jean Monnet fellow here. Uh, around the migratory pressures, so up until, I guess, around 2015, 16 or so, maybe the uh, Morocco and Tunisia would have been expecting that most of the migrants are kind of on their way to Europe. I mean, there is a large quantity of, peop of people migrating and working and returning, but there's also a sense that a lot of the people in our countries are on their way to Europe. That's become much more difficult now. 
And so is that part of it? And then specifically on Morocco, I have a question. So Morocco was outside the African Union for a long time because of Western Sahara. They've been readmitted. And you maybe discussed this, but I'd be interested to know about the dynamic around the regularization of my, the, the regularization program and the readmission to the African Union uh, as a bargaining question. Thank you. Um, any other in the room? Um... If not, uh, actually, I was going to say we do a second round, but Diego, uh, you seem to be the only one among the online audience. Is there anybody else online who would like to ask a question? If not, then Diego, I suggest you go now and then we just do everything together. Great. No, thanks. Thanks, Martin. Uh, thanks, Katarina. I, I look forward to reading the book. Two, two questions from a lawyer, obviously. Uh, the first one is uh, if uh, Tunisia is uh, going in this democratic transition since 2011, are you, aren't you a little bit in a rush to see changes in the laws in Tunisia? Uh, from my experience in South America, it takes countries two, three, four decades to change their migration laws. Uh, stability of the law is the norm, of course. Uh, and the second question, what is the role of international law? I'm thinking about the Migrant Workers Convention ratified by Morocco, not by Tunisia, and also about bilateral agreements on free movement um, that both countries have, have uh, ratified in the 60s and the 70s with different uh, African uh, countries. And that, for example, I think they play a role now with Libyans in, in Tunisia. There is a 1972 bilateral agreement on free movement there. Uh, so do you analyze those? Can those also help us explain the differences between both countries. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for these questions. So you've got about 10 minutes, Katarina, to pick and choose, and I'm sure people will be happy to engage uh, offline as well. So okay, yeah. Thanks so much for, for all of these questions. Let me let me see. Um Maybe first, Daniel. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah. So, by liberal migration policy, I don't. Uh, I don't just mean open in the sense of numbers, but also in the sense of rights. And I think that's actually where um, where sort of the the question of the paradox might be most paradoxical, because it's not only as in Gulf states about letting people in, but also actually giving them status, access to work permits, social uh, security, um, healthcare, et cetera, um, these kind of uh, topics as well. Um, integrate sort of uh, citizenship, uh, access to citizenship has not really been a question in, in uh, Morocco and Tunisia much so far, but that might be something for the future. But so definitely I'm not only talking about numbers. So um, that's maybe that's important to, to emphasize here. Um, about the uh, migratory pressure and um, and sort of what role does it does it play there? Um, I agree that to some extent, of course, um, this is an important factor. And um, indeed, the Moroccan and Tunisian case are quite different in the sense that there are much more migrants uh, in Tunisia compared to um, Morocco. Um, but actually, for me, this was uh, it was quite surprising because Morocco was the country that really politicized migration extensively, and in Tunisia, especially the Libyan presence has been, um, yeah, really down downplayed and and sort of left aside for largely geopolitical and economic reasons. Um, so I'm I'm talking about the question of migratory pressure in the book. I didn't really talk about it uh, today, but how this plays out in in practice, and then. Um, I don't think that uh, Morocco and Tunisia thought that the people who were coming were necessarily all on the way. It's part of a discourse around it, but I think they there is an, an understanding that many people end up actually staying um, or even coming to stay in the first place. Um, so I, I think that's mainly in the discursive area, something that's very big, but actually um, it's, it's not necessarily part of the reflections uh, around migration policy so much. Um, this question is about more the international realm. Um, so the African Union, but also what you mentioned, uh, Diego, the ILO and sort of bilateral agreements within Africa. Yes, this is uh, really, really important. So in the case of uh, Morocco, both the reaccession to the African Union, as well as their um, sort of signature of the ILO Migrant Workers Convention have been really crucial um, sort of, maybe not drivers, but triggers. Um, for um, sort of Morocco's political stance on, on migration. So the, the 2013 reform um, was partially a reaction to the, the first review mechanism within the, the ILO, um, where Morocco fared very badly. 
um, and um, because they were not actually meeting the requirements of the convention that they had signed themselves. And um, so this reform was partially also, well, was not presented as such, but was partially also to address the criticism that emerged from that um, review process at the, at the ILO. And actually now the second uh, process is undergoing. So I'm curious what will come out of that. Um, and the African Union membership, definitely this regularization and the whole sort of positive framing of immigration in Morocco was like a, a key tool for Morocco to actually position itself as uh, an sort of uh, important regional uh, leader uh, within the African Union. And actually Morocco is also um, leading the migration portfolio of the African Union, et cetera. I mean, you might be aware of that. So that has been uh, sort of geopolitically in terms of uh, a really important, uh, important element. Um, but still what I, uh, what I try to do is to not only um, look at the external international factors that drive migration politics, but also really to take seriously the, the domestic dynamics. And that goes back a little bit, maybe also to what Christoph said before that I, I'm not um, maybe discussing enough in the book, the role of parliament and political parties. Um, and also that touches maybe about uh, on, the, on the question from, from Martin about uh, the actors and the mechanisms of how they, how they relate. So I think um, maybe the, the parliament and political parties as really crucial actors within migration politics in general, actually both play a very insignificant role in both Morocco and, and Tunisia. So um, in Morocco, because immigration has been sort of elevated into an, uh, a topic by the king, and so it's part of these red lines that um, parties and, and other politicians are not really supposed to talk about, but also in Tunisia, where there was a very active sort of uh, creation and, and a sort of party landscape where there were lots of parties being created and disappearing, but migration wasn't really an, an issue for these partisan dynamics. Um, so I, I did interview quite, quite some parliamentarians as well, um, but they were all kind of wondering why I was stealing their time, like with this topic, <laughs> like it's not understanding why I wanted to know their position on immigration. So, um, and, and that was also very much, um, yeah, very much the, the case, well, right now, I mean, both under Ben Ali and, and uh, in the 10 years of the democratic experiment, basically political parties have been like unimportant actors also in the democratization context, which I thought was quite surprising, especially because directly after 2011, in the sort of two, three years afterwards, there was a lot of political talk about migration and a lot of civil society activism. Um, but parties didn't pick up on it. Parties sort of consciously decided to not engage with it. Um, and then, yeah, maybe um, lastly, sort of the question of the theoretical toolbox and the, Martin and also Lorenzo, your, your question um, about the role of civil society and this kind of actors. So actually, um, I think that's where, that's where I try to go with the book. So this kind of typology that I'm putting out there is not only about the actors, but also about the processes and the mechanisms. So I do argue that there are a lot more mechanisms and policy processes that are very similar uh, across political regimes than we might assume. Electoral politics is not one of them. So I do think that in at least consolidated um, democracies, of course, electoral dynamics are very different um, from those that we might want to see in, in Morocco. But it's that regarding, for instance, labor unions, that's quite interesting. Labor unions in Tunisia, for instance, have always played a very important role and were actually one of the few actors under Ben Ali who actively took a position on, on immigration and who sort of shaped this theme also transnationally. Um, while civil society is one of the key actors that pushed for um, a reform in Morocco. And actually it was the civil society, and that gets back also to the other questions, it was civil society, um, it was the civil society reports within the ILO review process that actually triggered sort of this whole uh, mechanism. So within the Moroccan context, civil society and migration has been one really powerful um, actor in, in, in many ways acting on similar sort of strategies and routes than what we might see across Europe. And they're also learning, of, of course, there's also transnational learning going on um, across those. So at least it's it's sort of a first step. I'm, I'm also um, sort of 
challenging my own thinking here and there because of course new new ideas coming up but I, what i hope to do with the book is sort of provide food for thought and see where we can take this um by going beyond the two cases uh, beyond sort of a regional uh, regional approach and and to also just trigger a discussion and have people sort of say no that's all wrong but then at least we're having a discussion about it and i think that's uh that's sort of what what i would hope for with the book so thanks I'll stop here. Oh, fantastic. Well, I think you've given us a lot of uh, food for thought and very many questions. And I'm amazed it's it's four o'clock. We managed to get through a lot of questions. So thank you for also being very concise in in, in your answers. So so thank you so much again, uh, Katarina, for a wonderful presentation. Thanks to the discussants, uh, Mehari and Christoph. And thanks to everybody here in the room and everybody online. And if anybody wants to continue discussion, I'm sure uh, Katarina will be happy to continue offline by email. Well, I don't know how you feel about your email inbox, but anyway, if you have questions more to discuss, uh, please do get in touch with Katarina and and do check out her, her book, which is available at your library, hopefully, and at any good bookstore, I'm sure. So thank you very much, and um, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.